If you haven't seen my other video on Ruby Alternate, please do so. It kind of gives context for this one. You guys brought up some really great points in the comments, so I wanted to take this opportunity to address them. Let's jump right into it. How do Blake's parents not know she's a Faunus? Just to clarify, Faunus are not born with their traits. They usually emerge as early as 7 or 8, or even as late as 16 or 17. They're like baby teeth or puberty. In the case of Blake, her normal human ears slowly became cat ears over time. It's no more painful than chest pains in a girl's formative years. In the case of an extra appendage like a tail or a horn, it usually just grows on its own and doesn't tend to replace any existing parts. As for why Blake's parents didn't notice her normal ears disappearing, let's just assume Blake is resourceful enough to not let them notice. Since she's pretty good at drawing, she could sculpt some sort of convincing prosthetic she can apply from time to time. To throw them off, she could even wear different bow sizes, sometimes settling for a slim weighted headband that easily blends into her hair. A lot of this is just me covering for an oversight I clearly made when talking about Blake, so maybe her parents already know she's a Faunus and are just avoiding the subject altogether, because Blake is so afraid of it. They aren't racists, and they still love their daughter, but without having that conversation, that could be another reason why they're so frightened of her enlisting at Beacon. On the other hand, she might not even tell them where she's enli- Okay, you know what, you get it. It's complicated. And by complicated, I mean I didn't think it through and fucked up. As a setup for the whole prosthetic business, you could even have a scene where it's established Blake is really good at makeup for some reason. How'd you get so good at makeup, Blake? Ha <laughs> yeah. What kind of religions are there? Whew. All right, I'm gonna be brief, but uh, long story short, there's a lot. Much like the time of the Industrial Revolution, people are growing up in more secular environments. Baradina San is obviously a theocratic order, so they're very religious, and some of the more traditional societies like Atlas could be religious as well. I'm even tempted to say religion has a place in Mistral, what with subverting our definition of communism, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The Church of Beacon is obviously a religious institution, and other denominations need not apply. They subscribe to the Gai Tree belief, which is a sect of Avenue that states a human being is separated into two spheres, the soul and the body. Animals, plants, Faunus, and Grimm, by this definition, have no soul. Purity of the human soul is at the heart of Gaitri doctrine. It's a religion that was founded in Gaelis and spread to the surrounding countries. There are Gaitri majorities in Atlas and the Free Banks, and a sizable minority in Boro. Just because I don't want to go too far from Ruby Former, let's say that the Gaitri belief calls the soul the aura. No idea how I'm going to bring semblance into this, probably not, I think it's stupid, but whatever. By far the largest religion is Alvinism, which emerged from the post-imperial beliefs of Anicism. Anicism believed that the fall of the Empire was the result of a massive war between Ani, God, and the Empire, and that the Grimm are Ani's creatures. As a result, the Empire was destroyed and the moon, Ani, was mortally wounded. This discouraged its followers from reusing imperial tech. Part of why the faith came into being was out of fear of repeating the past. Avanism emerged out of an Imeret that eventually became Baradina San as an interreligious reform of Avanism. It states that the massive war was actually between God and the Grimm, and that the Empire just got in the middle of it all. Not only does this justify using dust as a power source, but it's also what started the hunter societies en masse. Naturally, the very first ones were religious orders. How were LGBT people treated? Um, is this because of that one couple in volume 6? I'm not inclined to remove that. People can be whatever they want to be, but hey, you know, this is an age where people are finally removing themselves from religious doctrine, so it, it can't be that clear-cut. Let's just say that uh, homosexuality is in countries where religion isn't that big, and that people haven't gotten that used to transsexuals or bisexuality yet. Mistral, Celebrir, and Boro leave this issue pretty wide open and don't have any opinion on it, so gay lifestyles tend to thrive there. There are certain restrictions in Gaelis, and the law varies in the different city-states of the Free Banks, but in Atlas and Torrent, no. Torrent absolutely needs sons for their future wars, and Atlas is having a bad enough time removing the Faunus. In a country so historically religious, homosexuality would probably be frowned upon, but hey, that's not a reflection of my own beliefs. That's just to keep things interesting. Again, we need lots of conflict. Side note number two, Jean's sister can still be herself. She just moved away to one of these Golden Delta city-states where homosexuality is accepted. Because being in Mistral or Calabrier so close to Torrent is probably a bad idea. But would Jean look down on her for that? His father would for sure, but maybe Jean doesn't know what to think of it. Again, does he uphold the honor of his family as being loyal to the state, or does he support his sister? More foo-foo thought. Are the White Fangs still in operation, and if not, do they have an equivalent? 
The White Fang probably doesn't exist. I know a lot of you want it to be a big part of Blake's character, but I, I don't know. Doesn't that just prove everything people suspect of Faunus? I'm more inclined to just say it exists, but on an extremely small scale, like the Illuminati or whatever the Nazis called Jewish conspiracy groups. Protesters in Atlas would probably just use their name to incite fear and make it much bigger than it actually is. If I did include it, I doubt I'd use it in the main story. Additionally, while we're here, let's also call the anti faunus faction in Atlas, the Kurasayan Party, out of the totally made-up Atlan phrase, Am Kuras Hemelain Otrekia, or For Kuras the Lord, Human or Traitor. What I wouldn't be opposed to adding is something like the Underground Railroad, some kind of secret organization that moves Faunus out of Atlas to avoid persecution. Maybe Pyrrha can get swept up in it all? Again, leaving her at an impasse of doing what she thinks could be the right thing and what her father thinks is the right thing. Are they terrorists? Are they people? Is her father reinvigorating the country? And if so, does that excuse the persecution of Faunus? Let's get real deep with this, folks. Go nuts. What about those silver eyes? Well, although I think an ancient society of silver-eyed warriors is kind of cool, that pretty much just invalidates the fight against the Grimm with hunter societies and Baladin Hassan. It barely works in Ruby form as is, so I'm reluctant to reintegrate it here. If you guys have a good reason for it, then please let me know in the comments. Okay, so Jerry, communism without starving? Yeah, Mistral's communism probably needs to be constructed a bit more specifically. Let's just say communism is a bit exaggerated. Everyone is treated and paid mostly the same, the government has a strong influence on the press and the media, and most projects within its borders are government mandated. But there's still a strict caste system left over from the old kingdom, there's rudimentary free market, and some jobs pay higher than others for no other reason than it's more valuable to the employer. As some of you suggested, it's basic China today. The whole commune angle is just an excuse for higher government control, which is another reason why Torrent is such a threat. Would Ruby really start acting adult if Yang beat her up? Probably not. Again, that aside was off script and just something I came up with in the heat of the moment. I didn't think it through and it probably doesn't add up in the long run. I think something more accurate would be Ruby trying harder not only to impress Yang but to also become a decent hunter. But so far that's literally it. I'll think it over. Are you going to keep Sun? You guys wanted me to keep him in, so... Um, sure. We should populate this setting with characters that stand out. Even if I keep Sun as is and refuse to change him, he's at least a distinct design and gets a few laughs. I still fucking love this line. The White Fang is evil, I totally called it, and I'm bringing your daughter back! Someone suggested he could be a normal human guy who likes Faunus, and... Yeah, that sounds good. He could be the first one that learns Blake is a Faunus and has to keep that a secret from everyone, but also kind of blunders everything up. Kind of like Steve Palchuk. Also, Trollhunters fans, rise up. Rise up. Someone also mentioned Ozpin being this really secretive guy that's controlling everything from behind the scenes, and maybe... I, again, I have nothing for him. You guys, please talk about it in the comments. And Crow... <laughs> I, I don't fucking know. He's fine as is, I really like him. Oh, and cast Vic Mignogna for him, because removing him is a batshit stupid mistake and I hate rooster teeth. Again, I don't have a story fleshed out yet, this video was just supposed to be a world building exercise, so I'll leave it up to you. Who gets excluded, who stays. And just because I want to spite rooster teeth, Adam is here. Yay, he's here everybody. I have literally nothing for him, which is a bold-faced lie. I can totally imagine him being propagated as the villain, but is actually helping the Faunus escape Atlas, all of the Underground Railroad, which can get Pierre or Blake involved. But just because I want to shit on Rooster Teeth, he's in. And we'll certainly give him a better time than whatever the fuck Volume 6 did. Why did you kill him? That's why? Are there any villains? Torchwick is a classic crime boss, and I really do want him to be a reoccurring antagonist. Just not in the same terms we see him in Ruby Former. I'll elaborate in a bit. The villains in Ruby Former are less integrated into the world and have more to do with the story than anything else. They really only have a personal connection to the heroes after Volume 3, and even then you can hardly tell they're that big a threat. You got this scorpion dude who's crazy and stuff, but is that really worth just having them on their own? And that's where I come to my main point. I don't like Salem. I think her role is purely a farce to convince audiences there's a bigger story at hand in Ruby Former. There really isn't. She's inconsequential and only exists to make the world seem larger than it really is. If for whatever reason I do choose to have her, it would be as someone working from the shadows. We never see her face, we only hear the word Salem. We don't know if she's commanding the Grimm or if people are working beneath her. Let's just put our foot down and say her goal is to exterminate mankind before they can exterminate the Grimm 
Rim, which with the nuclear age fast approaching, is coming to a head very soon. If people get nukes, you can imagine where they'll be dropped first. But again, this is a world building exercise and I don't want to think too far ahead in any hypothetical story. So Tortric isn't following any real chain of command, at least for the most part. He's just another reoccurring villain of the week with his own jazzy, spiteful attitude. He'll do anything for a dishonest buck, it's who he is. And as for Cinder and her lackeys? Actually, shit, wait. Again, more colorful side characters is a plus, but should she be anything more than a regular antagonist? Again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. She could start out as Ruby's actual rival at Beacon, a sort of foil to Ruby herself, how they have the same color scheme. When Ruby tries acting grown up all of a sudden, Cinder's kind of just left in the dark. Her whole character is just playing off Ruby, and now that she's moved on from rivalries and childish antics, she could realize just how alone she really is. But that's just a start. What do you think I should do with these characters? This isn't really something you guys brought up, but let's talk about it anyways while we're here. Blake and Weiss are pretty shallow compared to Ruby and Yang. I did say I wanted to make Ruby the actual protagonist, but it's something that I've been thinking about nonetheless. So let's just say some random shit and hopefully it'll stick. Blake is really good at drawing and likes to read a lot. She doesn't like people because she's afraid they'll reject her for being a faunus. Simple, right? But we could make this be a trait of hers before her fondest traits even show up. Maybe she tells herself that to convince herself that being a shut-in and not socializing is good for her. Kind of like perpetuating loneliness to the point where if people do try interacting with her, she starts antagonizing them and trying to find some sort of sinister subtext to their initiative. She tries everything to not be assigned to a fire team, but gets put with Ruby Yang and Weiss anyway. So as soon as they start bunking together, she starts scrutinizing them. She could even be into reading and drawing to begin with because she's looking for a legitimate reason not to engage. Think along the lines of toxic loneliness, and I'm pretty sure there's a Kurtzgast video that deals with this. Conversely, Weiss can't escape who she is no matter where she goes. Even if she tries shutting herself in, people recognize her from a mile away. So when she enters Fireteam Ruby, originally Wibber, Weiss's family had the society change it to put her name in front. I have no idea why, that's just funny to me. She tries being the outgoing and lively one, but everyone knows who she is. They don't engage because they want to necessarily, they're doing it not to get in trouble. Again, Weiss's family practically owns the school. They don't want to piss Weiss off and get kicked out, which leaves Blake at an impasse. She kind of has to reach out to Weiss and get on her good side in order to avoid being removed from Beacon. But at the same time, she isn't comfortable with engaging with people or risking exposure as a faunus. Weiss sees through all of this and just wishes people would judge her for who she is rather than what she is, which just drives her to be more open and inviting than people wish she was. It kind of gives Nora a run for her money, actually. And now let's finish off with probably the biggest and most common point of conversation made about my reconstruction. You went to all this effort to build a world, and it's alright and all, but why even make it Ruby at this point? There's a clear absence of any themes present in Ruby Former, and the setting is so drastically different, it might as well be its own thing. You could literally rename the characters and nations and sell it as an original work. So, this part of the video will be me justifying this stark departure from OG Remnant. Very early on in the writing process, I hit something of a roadblock. I had literally no idea what kind of audience I was trying to adapt through before. The original series is such a clusterfuck of genres and themes that I'm not even sure they know who watches it. Is it for older audiences? Then why are everyone's names extraordinarily simple? Why are the characters even simpler to understand? Why is the logic of the show so basic and childish? What are the motivations for the villains other than being evil because it's what they are? And most importantly, why is the world and the nations in it so obnoxiously simplified and bland? And why do they have absolutely no large-scale conflicts whatsoever? And if it's being made for children, then why is that scorpion saying bitch? Why did she break his legs? Why are people's limbs getting cut off? Why are people getting cut in half? Why are people dying? Why is her blood. Mommy, mommy, holy shit, Jesus Christ, mommy, it's so scary, what the fuck? You get the point. Somewhere in my planning, I finally just decided to put my foot down and go full metal alchemist. <laughs> Ruby is probably the most fitting for a young adult crowd, so the world can be complex enough so it's not insulting with its intelligence, but innocent enough to where it's not overwhelming with its maturity. Literally, Fullmetal Alchemist, or maybe even Fable 2. Just not as quirky and stupid. And that brings me to my next point, which I brought up earlier. 
Ruby Former's world is offensively basic. A setting like Ruby Former's Remnant would probably seem pretty insulting to a young adult audience, and likewise, I saw this video as a means of rebuilding something that Rooster Teeth clearly didn't give a shit about. The world of Remnant series was an opportunity to expand a world building that otherwise seemed vapid and lacked any depth, but all it really did was double down on the fact that Rooster Teeth has absolutely no goddamn idea what it's doing. How are any of these kingdoms getting their food? We We've seen a whole one farm in the entire series, and I sincerely doubt Atlas is using some kind of futuristic GMO food processing to feed its entire nation, which, by the way, lives in the fucking Arctic. Don't even try saying they get their food from other nations. How the hell will they have survived the Great War then? You can't just ignore basic sustenance. And I actually gave Vakuo the benefit of the doubt in assuming it sounded at least a little credible as Vakuo. No, it's actually pronounced vacuo, like a fucking vacuum. And why is it in the middle of the desert? There's a temperate region right there. You can't, you know what, you get it. For a series that's so focused on exploring rem now, you'd expect something a little more interesting than the last airbender but without any cultural tension, societal transformations, large-scale conflicts, trade, wit, originality, passion, relationships, characters, it's fundamentally broken. If you want to remake Ruby to any positive effect, the first thing you gotta do is completely scrap Remnant. It's really not worth keeping intact in any way. It's not like the themes in Ruby Farmer are any good as they are either, so why even bother trying to honor them in a rewrite? I may have gone a little too far in uprooting Ruby Farmer world, and maybe I lost some of the wit, but hey, don't these characters deserve that? Why would I want to waste these great designs in a world with barely any thought? If the audience is going to explore Remnant, why not make it worthwhile? Why not go nuts? And also, what would be the point of watching a 35 minute video if you're just gonna get the same thing from Ruby Former? My goal wasn't to fix Ruby, it was to rebuild it from the ground up, without exception. Even if I include characters like Salem, Cinder, or Sun, they would have to be different in some kind of way. That's that's how extensive I want this to be. So please, don't expect me to preserve any of the original series bullshit. This is probably why the Ruby subreddit didn't like what I had to say. I didn't post the video there, but someone else did, and I really am grateful. I got some of these points from there, and I'm glad I could address them. Something I did want to clarify though, because I'm not sure the mods weren't looking for an excuse to end a discussion like this, is that even though Monty was a visionary and we all loved him, the mistakes I'm trying to resolve in Ruby Former were his mistakes as well. As brilliant and as legendary as he was, it was still his show, and a lot of the the things I dislike about Ruby Former were things that he brought to the table. But even then, this video wasn't made to spite Monty. It was made to spite Rooster Teeth. If you don't have the foresight to tell that they're milking Ruby for everything it's worth by making its episodes, its scenes, its conversations, and even its fucking frame rate slower, then you're just the right kind of crowd to be manipulated by them. Stop giving them money! And Red vs. Blue, please, for the love of God, stop! Thank you and good night. I've decided to make this a series of video addendums to the lore in case more things need to be elaborated on. I'm still not convinced we've built a setting where cute girls fighting demons with awesome weapons is status quo, so I'll be working at this until I am. If you haven't checked out my other content already, please feel free. Thank you all for dropping by, and I'll see you next time. I can't wait to go into this editing bay and edit my Ruby lore video. What the fuck? What the fuck? Who did this? Who put this?